Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I think it's kind of unusual to give the opening talk in a conference as one of the organizers, but I guess this is not the most unusual thing about this workshop, so we can safely ignore it. Um, yeah, so I will give an introductory series of two lectures on, on Cartan geometries. Yeah, and I should say it's, it's great to be back in a real lecture room with real people sitting there. And it's also great that people who can't be who can't be here in person have the opportunity to watch this online. So um, to get started, um, okay. So this will be the first lecture in a series on two on Cartan geometries, and I will start with the general motivation for the notion of Cartan geometries. Um, a family of basic examples, which gives you a first feeling of, of what you can get in that way. And then I'll outline some general features that are valid for all Cartan geometries, which also show you what the class of these geometric structures may look like. Okay, and the main focus of this first lecture will be the Cartan geometry of conformal structures which has a close connection to, to higher spin. And the main point I want to make here is that for conformal structures, uh, the Cartan description brings in an aspect of higher order. So this is related to the fact that there are conformal isometries that equal the identity to first order in a point, but don't equal the identity locally around that point. And this is a specific feature of conformal geometry, which is very different from, say, Riemannian geometry. And this is reflected in a way in, in, in all the conformally invariant uh, calculi and descriptions of, of conformal structures and stuff like that. Okay. The second main part of this talk will be um, kind of provide some, some background on introductory lectures that, that will come later during the, the workshop. So I will briefly discuss the relation of the Cartan description of conformal structures to other descriptions which will be used, like tractors and tractor calculi, the ambient metric, and the Poincare metric. And I will also explain a bit how these descriptions uh, generalized to descriptions of conformally compact manifolds. Okay, yeah, as I said, this will, this will connect to the lectures of, of Michael Eastwood and, and Rod Gover in, in the coming weeks. All right, and in the second talk, it will be tomorrow, uh, I will talk on more general families of Cartan geometries which are in a way closely related to conformal structures. And I will, I will focus again on, uh, on examples that connect to the topics of this workshop, namely either they connect to conformal geometry or they connect to the geometric theory of differential equations in some way. All right, so let me get started with discussing generalities on Cartan geometries. And there is a very, very fundamental principle right in the beginning. What you want to do with a, with a Cartan geometry is you want to describe manifolds that are endowed with certain geometric structures as what we call a curved analog of a homogeneous model. Okay? And one of the standard examples that you should have in mind is Euclidean space. This is the homogeneous model. This is where Euclidean geometry lives. And Riemannian geometry or a Riemannian manifold can be viewed as a curved version of flat Euclidean space. This is an example that you can always keep in the background. But the important point here is you start thinking about Cartan geometries by thinking about the homogeneous model. Yeah, so somehow a, a specific homogeneous space should be somewhere in the background. I should say that there are slight generalizations of the concept which don't really need a homo homogeneous model, but morally it's always there, okay? Right. And so what you should think about um, that you start with some kind of model structure 
on a homogeneous G mod H for which the automorphisms that preserve the structure are exactly the left actions of the elements of G. And this is exactly what happens on Euclidean space. If you view Euclidean space as a Riemannian manifold, so this is just flat Rn, then the isometries of these flat Rn are exactly the, the, the rigid motions. So they are exactly the, the actions of the group of rigid motions. So if you view Euclidean space as a homogeneous space of, of the Euclidean group, this is exactly what we have in mind here. Okay? Right. And now Elie Catan ran into the general or came up with the general concept of a Catan geometry motivated by an alternative description of these left translations. So what he realized is that on any homogeneous space, whatever it looks like, you can always characterize the left translations of elements of G in a very nice fashion. And this is the, the motivation for the, for the definition. So first of all, for any homogeneous space, you have a projection from the group to the homogeneous space. And it's just abstract nonsense that this is an H principal bundle. So if you project from G to G mod H, and it carries a very nice object, namely the left Maurer Catan form, which just encodes the trivialization of the tangent bundle of the, of, of the group by left translations. Okay. And so this is a Lie algebra valued one form where the Lie algebra is the one of the big group G and not of the small group H. Okay. So it's not, it's not looking like a principal connection on this principal bundle, which would be a Lie algebra of H valued one form, but it's a different object. Okay. Right. And then uh, it's an easy exercise to prove that the left actions of elements of G are exactly those diffeomorphisms of the homogeneous space, which admit a lift to a principal bundle automorphism, which in addition preserves the left Maurer Catan form. Yeah, and this is just a general, general fact from Lee theory. So you know that, for example, if you look at diffeomorphisms of Euclidean space, the isometries are exactly those that uh, lift to principal bundle automorphisms on the Euclidean group and pres that preserve the left Maurer Catan form. Yeah, and this is, this is what you have there. And another very fundamental feature here is the left Maurer Catan form satisfies the Maurer Catan equation. This is why the Maurer Catan equation has its name. And so this is just d omega of xi and eta plus the bracket in G of omega of xi and omega of eta is zero. Yeah, so this is just the standard Maurer Catan equation. And this expresses from the point of view of Catan geometry, the fact that this homogeneous space is flat. Okay. And so then if you, if you, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. The question was whether, whether you can re replace this, 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 uh, this condition here that it respects omega by the fact that it commutes with left translations. No, because the maps that compute, commute with left translations are right translations. Yeah, and we want to characterize left translations. Yeah, so it, 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 it wouldn't make sense because we would use the thing we want to characterize, but it also wouldn't lead to the right result. Okay? Right. And now if you have this result in mind, then the general definition of a Catan geometry and of its curvature is just an obvious generalization of this away from the homogeneous setting. Sound has almost gone. No, I hope it's not too bad. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the general definition. So as I said, you start with a homogeneous model, G mod H. So what you're saying is, a, or what you're defining is a Catan geometry of type GH, and such a thing is given by a principal H bundle, mimicking the projection from the group G to G mod H, and that's also the reason for the notation. I'm using a curly G here because this is like the curved version of the group G, 
And in addition, you have a replacement for the left Maurer Cartan form, which is then called a Cartan connection. And this is omega, which is a Lie algebra of G valued one form on G. And the defining properties of a Cartan connection just mimic well known properties of the Maurer Cartan form. Namely, uh, it trivializes the tangent bundle. Yeah, as I said, the Maurer Cartan form just encodes the trivialization of the tangent bundle by left translation. So the value in each point is a linear isomorphism from the tangent space at this point to the Lie algebra. Okay. Right. Um, second, it should be equivariant with respect to the principal right action, which is what you have canonically on the on the principal bundle. Yeah, and you don't have anything. This is true. You don't have anything else on the principal bundle, but it should be equivariant for the right action of the structure group. Uh, and this is again a property that the Maurer Cartan form would have for right translations by G, but right translations by G don't make sense here. We can just talk about right multiplications by H. And finally, the Maurer Cartan form, if you insert the left invariant vector field, you get back its generator. So uh, the, the general version of this is you don't have left invariant vector fields, but what you have is the so-called fundamental vector fields for the for generated by elements of the Lie algebra of H, and their generators should be reproduced by the Cartan connection. Okay? Yeah, so you really take just those properties of the Maurer Cartan form, which do make sense in this more general setting, and turn them into a definition. All right? So, and then, um, not very surprising, the curvature of such a Cartan geometry, there is a general definition. You just define it as the amount to which the Maurer Cartan equation fails to hold. Yeah? So, the Maurer Cartan e equation was exactly that uh, this right hand side is zero. And now, in general, you define the right hand side to be the curvature of the Cartan geometry. Okay. Um, right. Oops. <laughs> no worries. Oh, yeah, no, it's very low. Okay. So I hope it's better now for those who are participating remote. Okay, so the first observation, since you require that uh, value in each point is a linear isomorphism, dimensions have to match up. Yeah, so such geometries exist only on manifolds whose dimension is the same of the homogeneous model. So being careful, we wouldn't talk about Riemannian geometry here, we would talk about Riemannian geometry in dimension n. Yeah. And there is no real, no real difference between, uh, I mean, there is no real relation between different dimensions. Okay. Uh, second thing is, um, there is an obvious notion of morphisms. Yeah? You have principal bundles, so there are principal bundle morphisms, and along such, you can pull back the Cartan connection, so you know what the morphism of Cartan geometries is. And by this linear isomorphism property, uh, such morphisms always are local diffeomorphisms, and in particular, they induce local diffeomorphisms between the base manifolds. Uh, so you automatically get for free a notion of morphism with the notion of, of Cartan geometry. Okay, so let's hope for the best. Okay, um, right. And as we saw, the curvature on the, uh, on the homogeneous model vanishes by the maurer cartan equation, but actually much better, um, there is a general result that vanishing of this curvature is equivalent to local isomorphism to the homogeneous model as a geometry. Uh, you get this for free whenever you're dealing with a Cartan geometry. Uh, the geometry is locally isomorphic to the homogeneous model, if and only if its Cartan curvature vanishes. All right. Yeah. 
So you see already, I mean, as you can see, this is a terribly general concept. Yeah? You can start with any homogeneous space, and in many instances, you will get out nonsense or bullshit or, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah? But in some cases, you get out really interesting stuff. Okay, so uh, let's start with a rather simple class of examples. So this is not yet the interesting examples, but I think it, it gives a start of a perspective. So what we do is let's take the group GLNR, and let's take any subgroup of that, okay? And then we can add translations to the actions of elements of H on Rn. And so we get automatically a group of affine transformations. Yeah, so if you take GLN, GLN itself, you get all affine transformation. If you take ON, you get Euclidean motions. And, and so on and so forth, okay? So your group H gives rise to a group of affine transformations. And of course, this acts transitively on RN because you put in translations. So you can easily see that G mod H is isomorphic to RN. And the projection from G to G mod H, for those of you who are, who are familiar with the concept of G structures, this is just the standard flat H structure on RN. So in particular, if you start with ON is H or H equal to ON, you just get the flat remaining matrix on RN. Right. And now for this special kind of group, yeah, the affine extension of a subgroup of GLN and this subgroup, yeah, so H is some subgroup of GLN and G is its affine, affine extension, you get a complete equivalent description of what it means to be a Cartan geometry of that type. And namely, this is the proposition we wrote here, if you have a Cartan geometry of type GH on an N-manifold, this is equivalent to an H structure, yeah, just a reduction of the, of the frame bundle of N to the structure group H, together with a compatible connection. Okay, so for an H structure, there is a notion of compatible connection. So in the case of ON, this would be an ON structure, which is the same thing as a Riemannian metric, plus a compatible, compatible connection, which means a metric connection. Okay. And then this Cartan curvature K exactly encodes the torsion and the curvature of this compatible connection. All right. <laughs> and the proof is, is not, not difficult at all. You just look at what the what the real algebra G looks like. Yeah, it's just as a vector space, it's a direct sum. Algebraically, it's a semi-direct sum of H plus Rn, the Rn coming from the translations. And so if you have a Cartan connection with values in this, you can split it into components. And I call the H component gamma and the Rn component theta. And then it turns out that this isomorphism here is not only true as a vector space, but also as a, as a representation of the group H. And this then means that these two components here are separately equivariant. So each of the components is equivariant because the H action doesn't mix the components. Okay. Right. And now you're just in a land of you know, where, where you know what things are because Gamma now is a, is a one form with values in the Lie algebra of the structure group with the right properties, so it's a principal connection. And theta is what is called a strictly horizontal Rn value one form. So its kernel in each point is the vertical subspace. And such a form is well known to be equivalent to a homomorphism to the frame bound. Can you repeat this theta? Can you repeat the last two lines? The last two lines. So this theta is strictly horizontal. Its kernel in each point is the vertical subspace. And a horizontal, strictly horizontal equivariant form is the same thing as a homomorphism to the frame bundle. It's just, yeah, easy. Yeah, it descends to isomorphisms on the tangent spaces below, and it's just going through definitions. And the gamma now is a one form with values in the Lie algebra of the structure group, which has the right properties, so it's a principal connection, just standard definition. Okay, no, no verification or anything like that. So you see, 
you have a reduction of structure group, you have a principal connection, then you just compute what, what d omega plus this bracket expression here means in terms of gamma and theta. So d omega is just d gamma plus d theta. And for the bracket, you have to check how these two components interact. But what you run into is exactly the standard de description of, tur of curvature and torsion of, of such an edge structure. Yes, so it's just a direct. This proof is for this example. This proof is only for this example, and also the statement is only for this example. But the proposition was for GH general, no? No, 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 no. It's this G and this H. Otherwise, I could go home because the concept would be uninteresting. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about it. It's for this specific choice of G and H. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. If this were general, I would go home at this point because it wouldn't be terribly interesting as it stands because everybody would say, yeah, uh, if you choose a compatible connection, this is not something that we want to do. Yeah. So that's really the problem at this level. If you, if you look at these specific models, it seems like, yeah, the geometry gives you a nice picture or the Catan picture gives you a nice picture. And I will say more of, about this later. But in a way, it's not really what we what we would mean by a geometric structure because we have to choose a complete connection. Okay. But if you think about what you've learned in, in your first Riemannian geometry course, uh -huh, for Riemannian manifolds, there is a compatible connection, which is canonically there. And so if you if you go to situations like that, then this already leads to interesting stuff. And this is the next thing I want to do. Namely, if you take the group away in itself, then you know you have the Levy Civita connection, which is the unique metric torsion free connection. Um, putting things that way is kind of, kind of playing down the role of this picture because actually the nicest proof of this fact is exactly in this picture. Yeah, you just go to this, this picture I outlined on the page before theta and gamma. You check what happens when changing gamma, and you easily run into existence and uniqueness of the Levi-Civita connection. Yeah, so it's not only not that you have to take the fact from outside, but this is the this is the approach in which you in which you can most easily verify these things. Okay, and um, note that here it's not it's not spectacular, but the torsion freeness is a condition that you impose. Yeah, in principle, you could also look at metric connections with torsion. And this is what we call a, a normalization condition in the, in, in the land of Cartan geometries. And this plays a very important role. And this comes up a bit more prominently in the second, in the second, um, second example. If you now take a subgroup of OA, yeah. And in general, there will be no torsion-free connection on this on this smaller reduction. Yeah, this is if you're familiar with this, think about almost hermitic manifolds or something like that. But what you can always do is there you can choose an edge invariant linear subspace of skew-symmetric bilinear maps from lambda to R and starting to R n, and you should just think of this as the space that it looks like torsion tensors. Uh, bilinear skew-symmetric maps from Rn times Rn to Rn. This is what the, what the torsion tensor in the point looks like. And if you choose such, such a space, I mean, actually, in this case, it's even canonical. Yeah, you can find a canonical subspace in here, which we call then a normalization condition in general. And then passing to associated bundles, this gives a sub-bundle everywhere, and you can safely say what it means that the Qatar connection has torsion in N, but I will skip over these this technicalities. It's not, it's not terribly difficult. But then still, again, you get the unique Qatar connection by requiring that the torsion has values in N, and then this torsion is the first fundamental invariant, which is what, what you call intrinsic torsion in the theory of these structures. Okay? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, as I said already, even, even for these simple examples, the Catan picture is a beautiful point of view. In particular, if you start doing submanifold geometry or something like that, the Catan picture is absolutely great. 
Also, I will list a few uh, general results on Cartan geometries on the next page. Um, they give you substantial theorems even in the setting of, of, of Riemannian geometry. Yeah. Um, okay, but still uh, in this situation here, yeah, still in the in the case of a fine extensions, or where you get a canonical Cartan connection. Um, the Cartan point of view isn't really needed. Yeah, you can always rephrase things in terms of, of uh, compatible connections on a G structure, principal connections, and stuff like that. Yeah, so in this in this sense, it's not uh, it's not something that you fundamentally need. It's just a nice picture. But if you go beyond that, yeah, and go say to to conformal structures. Then there is there is no hope to to rephrase things in terms of principal connections or at least not this specific. Okay. Right. Okay. So some general features. Uh, this Cartan curvature turns out to be a fundamental and complete invariant, even in a technical sense. Uh, there are theorems that tell you that we can recover any differential invariant from the Cartan curvature. Blah blah blah. Okay. Uh, second, since you are working with a principal edge bundle, yeah, this is what, what this is one of the ingredients of your geometry. Representations of edge give you natural vector bundles whenever you have a Cartan geometry. Yeah. So in a way, you see already that the properties of your Cartan geometry will be kind of governed by representation theory of edge, or at least there is a lot that you can learn from representations of edge or representation theory of edge. Okay? Even more nicely, there is a specific representation, namely if you look at the Lie algebra G, H acts on it via the H joint representation because H is a subgroup of G, and Lie algebra H is an invariant subspace, so you can pass to the quotient. And when you go to this to, to this quotient representation, then the induced bundle is the tangent bundle. So you can recover all tensor bundles and everything like that is associated bundles to a Cartan bundle, whatever type the Cartan geometry is. No restrictions whatsoever. Yeah. So whenever you have a Cartan geometry, it is tied closely to the to the structure of the manifold because the tangent bundle is associated to. To, uh, to the Cartan bundle. Okay. Right. Then there are some general tools, like you can start with notions of distinguished curves in a homogeneous space, get to canonical curves in, in Cartan geometries. Of course, in the Riemannian case, this gives you geodesics, but there are much more complicated things like conformal circles or chains in CR geometry and stuff like that, which can be described in this language. Um, moreover, uh, there is a general notion of infinitesimal automorphisms on the, on the Cartan geometry. You, know, you just take vector fields on the Cartan bundle, which are invariant under the action of the structure group, and whose Lie derivative, so such that the Lie derivative of the Cartan connection vanishes. You know, so this is a general, general notion, and it's obviously the infinitesimal version of an automorphism of a Cartan geometry. And you know, so these are vector fields on the total space of the Cartan bundle. And then there is a general theorem that whatever type you're looking at, uh, the automorphisms of any Cartan geometry form a Lie group. And the dimension of this Lie group is bounded above by the dimension of the group G. And the Lie algebra is exactly what you would hope for. Yeah, it's those infinitesimal automorphisms whose flow is defined for all times. Yeah? And again, even for Riemannian geometry, the fact that the isometry group of a Riemannian manifold is a Lie group is a, is a substantial theorem. Yeah, and here you just get it for free from, from general results. And this explains the rule. But why for all times? Sorry? Is that the flow is defined for all times? Because if the uh, if, when you have a group acting on a manifold, the, the, the vector fields coming from these group actions are always complete. Yeah. But, but but in a Riemannian manifold, if you cut out the hole, then the geodesics can run inside, right? Yeah, but then the, the point is um, the notion of an infinitesimal automorphism is like this is a killing field in, in, in Riemannian terms. Yeah. 
but a healing field, the, the Lie algebra of the isometry group is the algebra of all complete killing fields and not the algebra of all killing fields. Because if you take a point out of a Riemannian manifold, the size of the isometry group drops. Yeah, because you have to preserve that point in order to preserve the complement. Okay, and then there are several constructions relating geometries of different types, and I will say a bit about these in, in my second talk. Okay, so I should probably speed up a bit, but <laughs> let's see. Um, so I want to talk about next about the Catan description of complement structures. Okay, so in, in the language we produced so far, Conformal structures can be rather, can be defined rather easily. They are just edge structures where H is the conformal group. Um, by the way, I'm I'm restricting here to a setting of, of positive definite, so conformal Riemannian. This is by no means necessary. Things work completely parallel for, for a pseudo-Riemannian Navy signature. Yeah, it's just more, more tedious to write off, so I, I, I restrict it to the to the definite case here, but this is just for convenience. Okay, so this is, is an edge structure. Equivalently, you can say on each tangent space, you have an in, inner product up to positive, positive multiples. And then such an inner product, yeah, and you want to do this to the end smoothly on the point, of course. And then this brings you to the best known description. You can, you can, this determines an equivalence class of, of Riemannian matrix in such a way that the value in each point lies in this, in this ray. And this is just Riemannian matrix up to conform to scale. Yeah. But you should keep in mind that in a way, conformal geometry is more than allowing conformal rescaling of a Riemannian matrix. Yeah. And we will see this in, in, in some. In some instances. Okay, so this is this is what conformal structures are, and I guess you can know that. Um, one remark: we go to dimensions at least three here because in dimension two, conformal geometry is an entirely different story. It's not a finite type geometry, yeah, because in dimension two, uh, what is C O N? Uh, okay, question: What is C O N? It's the conformal orthogonal group. So you take orthogonal transformations and multiples of the identity and or annihilations, if you want, and take the group generated by those. This is the conform group. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. So in two dimensions, conformal is related to holomorphic, as you all know. Uh, and so this is an entirely different story. Yeah, because yeah, holomorphic. Biholomorphisms are infinite dimensional and so on and so forth. Okay. I just want to mention that there is a two-dimensional analog of, of the conformal geometry that we are that we are discussing here. So there is a two-dimensional version of a finite type geometry that is related to conformal structures, and these are called Möbius structures. But this is just as an aside, they won't show up here. Okay, and now there is a there is a very, very important first observation, namely uh, any conformal structure it, it needs compatible torsion-free connections. This is obvious because, for example, you can take the levi vitar connection of any matrix in the conformal class. But the class of these compatible connections, which are usually called well connections, uh, this is larger than just the class of Levy Civitar connections of matrix in the conformal class. And indeed, pointwise, these wild, these wild connections form an n dimensional affine space. And if you know the story, this is exactly the computation that if you compute the first prolongation of the conformal algebra as a sub algebra of GLN, then the result will be n dimensional. Yeah, and this is kind of the first step towards analyzing conformal structures as a G structure and so on and so forth. And this is a purely linear algebra computation. And this will be very important for the, for the general investigations that we are going to discuss. Okay, yeah. And then algebraic results imply that there might be a Cartan geometry description. This is now cut in short uh, these, these linear algebra computations. As I said, um, 
What this is about is what is called the prolongations of the conformal algebra as a subalgebra of GLN. Yeah? And you can also view this if you're coming from the side of, of PDEs. Uh, you're looking at the PDE, it governs conformal isometries. Yeah? And this has one non trivial prolongation, which is n dimensional, but the second prolongation vanishes. Yeah? A conformal isometry is determined by its two jet in a point, which means that the second prolongation vanishes. The first prolongation is n dimensional. And so if you reinterpret it, uh, you see that there might be a Cartan geometry description of conformal structures where the structure group, so this is now the right edge for the homogeneous model, will be an n-dimensional extension of the conformal group. Yeah, you exactly have to add the first prolongation there in some way. Yeah. But if you do these algebraic computations, yeah, and this is really linear algebra, it's not, not difficult at all, it's just, you know, um, but it's, it's getting a bit tedious. Um, but getting group structures here and finding a group G and the subgroup H is very difficult in this picture. Yeah. Okay, so what you can do alternatively is pull a homogeneous model out of the head. Yeah, because if you have a nice homogeneous model, then you can check whether, whether things work out with state homogeneous model. Okay, and so for physicists, it's very easy to understand what this, what this homogeneous model looks like because you're, you're looking at a Lorentzian metric in dimension n plus 2. And as we all know, a Lorentzian metric, the most important thing it has is a light cone. And if you look at the space of lines in that light cone or the space of forward pointing rays in that light cone, you see in my poor three-dimensional drawing, this looks like a circle. But if you go from three to n plus two, you find out it looks like an n-sphere. Okay. So what happens is you take a Lorentz group in dimension n plus two, um, and this acts transitively on the n-sphere, where you view the n-sphere as the projectivized light cone, or right? as the space of forward-pointing light rays. This is these are small technicalities. Okay. And now if you look at uh, yeah, this is this is linear algebra to see that this action is transitive. And uh, this gives you an identification of the of the n sphere as a homogeneous space of SON plus one one. Okay. And yeah, if you just take the subgroup of SON plus one one, which stabilizes one of these light rays then you find the right subgroup P. Yeah. And in this way, you get a real realization of Sn as G mod P. And P suggests that this will be a parabolic subgroup of this at the moment. It's just notation. OK? Right. And now it's actually, it's a very nice exercise to take this and construct a conformal structure on the sphere from this picture. Yeah, this can be easily done by, by linear algebra linear algebra operations. And then you see that this conformal structure will be preserved by, uh, by the action of the group G, yeah, which is huge. It's much bigger than, than the isometry group of the sphere. Yeah, I mean, huge. I mean, N plus one, which is bigger. But, um, okay. So, yeah, otherwise you can just compute that uh, the action is conformal for the conformal class for the, of the wrong metric. And you can actually see the, com uh, the conformal metrics here, because if you think about the projectivization from the light cone to the sphere, and you split it, so you re-embed the sphere into the light cone, yeah, and you take the metric induced from the ambient, from what is there ambiently, to get a conformal scaling of the round metric. And if you embed it like, like I did in my drawing, you get the round. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. 
So now let's analyze this a bit more. I mean, you can just sit down, uh, write out the group G in an, in an appropriate form and compute what things look like. But what happens is if you, oops, sorry. If you, if you take the point, so P is just a stabilizer of one point. So we have some base point in our sphere. And then we can look at, so P is a formal isometries of the sphere that fix this base point. So we can differentiate such an isometry in this base point, and we get a homomorphism from P to the conformal group in that way, which is subjective and has n dimensional kernel. Okay, so the kernel of this homomorphism is a normal subgroup, which I call P plus in P, which is isomorphic to our n dual, which is good news because we exactly wanted an n dimensional extension of the conformal group. And this P actually turns out. What is G here? I'm not sure who is G. Ah, G is SO, SO zero in plus one one. The problem is small G. I mean, so no, it's in the right. Ah, okay. So, okay. Small G. You have an element of P. It deter determines a, a, a map from the sphere to itself by the left action. It fixes the base point. And you differentiate this map in the base point. It's like the isotropy representation that you get on in the space. And this exactly gives you any trans conformal transformations there or any conformal linear maps. But there is more. And this is exactly where we are going now. So the kernel of this homomorphism is a normal subgroup, isomorphic to R and U, and P is a semi direct product of the conformal group and this R and U. So this is. This will be more terribly important and false. But now the main point is exactly now I'm getting to this higher order issue that I was announcing earlier. Um, if you take such an element of P plus, yeah, what does this mean? This means, first of all, it's in P, so it fixes O. But the derivative here has to be the identity in CON. So it fixes the base point to first order. It fixes the base point, and each derivative in the base point is the identity. But still, uh, if G is not the identity element, it doesn't fix the base point to second order. And these are exactly these conformal transformations that have trivial one jet in a point, one jet equal to the identity in the point, but the two jet in that point is different. Yeah, and this is this is related to reflections on a circle and, and stuff like that in, in elementary conformance. Yeah. So you can see that there are there is second order business coming in. Yeah. You sometimes need second derivatives when talking about conformal structures. And this is this is bad news in a way, yeah, because no tensor bundle sees second derivatives in a point. Yeah. So this already suggests that you will need some, some unusual objects in order to describe things in a nice fashion. Yeah? Um, and since it's just second derivatives, there is a chance to reasonably do this. Yeah? If, if you would need infinitely many derivatives, then, then you would get to doing analysis more or less. Yeah? But since we are just talking about one more derivative, there is there is a chance to capture things in a non-trivial fashion. Okay, um, in particular, this fact that you that you can get stuff that, that equals the identity to first order but not to second order tells you that there cannot be an invariant connection. Yeah, because if you have a connection, you have geodesics, and, and yeah, whenever you preserve a connection, you preserve geodesics. So if you are the identity in to first order in a point, then you are the identity locally around that point. Okay. I said that off enough already. Yes. What do you mean sometimes it can be second order? Is it a matter of the conformal class? Is it a matter of particular points on the manifold? Um, or is it every this, point? This is something that I that I don't want to get into really. Okay. So the question was uh, where where does this second order issue show up? In the end, you find out that really as globally defined conformal isometries. 
Yeah. This effect only shows up on the homogeneous model. Yeah, this is this is a deep theorem, though. Yeah. So on generic, I mean, on generic conformal manifolds, you don't have any conformal isometries. Yeah. But conformal isometries, which are non non trivial, um, which 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 have trivial one jet but non trivial two jet, only exist on low relief flat structures. But still, this effect. But, but this happens on, on, on particular points only, or on every point in such a, an example? In, uh, the, the, um, on every point. Yeah. yeah. Because on the homogeneous model, it's automatically if you have it in one point, you have it everywhere, and locally flat means locally isomorphic to the homogeneous model. So again, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So um, now. Um, Let's recapitulate. We, we kind of saw that there is hope to get a Cartan description. We kind of put a homogeneous model out of our head, uh, which might have the right properties. Okay, so now let's try to bring these together. If I take the groups G and P from the, from the last slide, then you can easily see that a Cartan geometry of a type has an underlying conformal structure. Yeah, this is just elementary because you can basically factorize by this group P plus and you get back to a first order G structure. It's really easy. So I don't want to go into details here. It's, it's straightforward. Okay. And then there is the a, a congruent theorem which is which is due to Eli Catan. Um, so if you have a conformal structure on a smooth N manifold with N at least three. This can be canonically extended to a Cartan geometry of type GP, provided, and this is exactly what this canonically means, is you have to require that the curvature satisfies a normalization condition. Okay. And if you require this, this normalization condition, um, then this, this construction becomes unique. And I will now outline the classical proof of this fact. Which is based on prolongations. Uh, I, I should say, from the from the perspective that I'm I'm trying to develop in my lectures, this construction has substantial weaknesses, and I will maybe say a bit more about this in my second lecture. Um, but here, it's visible uh, why things work out, yeah, but they become rather specific towards towards conformal geometry. Whereas, if you want to generalize, you want to uh, reduce things to the algebraic core. Yeah? And this is, this is actually the opposite direction. Yeah? This, is, this is going to specifically geometric stuff. But at this point, I think it's the right move to try to understand why, why does the construction work out for conformal structures. OK. So we were talking about wild connections already. Yeah, you have compatible torsion-free connections on any conformal structure. And I said that, um, yeah, these of course can be, okay. So I start with a with, with the G structure, this uh, H structure, G zero structure description of a conformal structure. So this is just by a principle um, bundle with structure group C O N and such a strict, strictly horizontal R N value one. Okay, and then we've talked already about wild connections, and these wild connections can now be interpreted as principal connections on G0. Okay, and I said that in each point, there are values form an n dimensional affine space. And it's important to observe here that torsion freeness can be seen on the value of a connection forming one point. Yeah, so it, it makes sense to say I take a point. And I want all torsion free connection forms in that point. I cannot say I want all flat connections, connection forms in that point. This would be a differential equation. But torsion free, you can say point wise. Okay. Right. So now you have an n dimensional space in each point of G0. So you just attach this space to G0. So you attach the, the values of the wild connections in the point U0 to the point U0. And use these to construct the fiber bundle G over N. 
And then there is a bit of algebraic, algebraic zigzag going on. Uh, you can extend the, the action of the conformal group to an action of this group P that I didn't describe in detail yet. Um, for physicists, it's called, uh, what's it called? Conformal transformation fix, fixing the point. Poincare conformal group, I think. I hope so. Um, uh, okay. So you can extend this, this action to an action of this group P on G and make this G into a principal P bound. So we have the first ingredient for our Carton geom. Okay. But now you see um, our additional things that we add we are connection forms. Yeah. So this gives us the chance to define something like a tautological form on that bound. Okay, so a point in G is the value of a principal connection form in some bundle in, in some point of G0. So if you have a tangent vector up there, you project it down to G0, you evaluate the given connection form on this tangent vector. This gives you a one form on G0 with values in the Lie algebra of the group G0. So this little G0 is just the Lie algebra of the conformal group. Okay. And then you take this together with the with the strictly horizontal form that you had already, and you get something like a partial trivialization of your tangent bundle downstairs. Yeah, this is like like the construction of this of this strictly horizontal RN value form that I was talking about before. All right, and now you have this this isomorphism of the downstairs tangent space. You can just check what it needs to lift this. To an isomorphism to a linear isomorphism upstairs. So you still you are in a point to try to lift this to a linear isomorphism, which is what you want from a Cartan connection. What this is curly G0 again. This curly G0 is the is the Lie algebra of the conformal group. So this is what you have given as an as an underlying structure. The curly G? Curly G is SO n plus one one. It's not a principal bundle. G is not a principal bound. Uh, okay, it mean, I'm not sure what you mean by curly. Oh, okay, so this curly G zero, <laughs> this this is the underlying conformal structure. Yeah, this is the conformal structure encoded into a principal bundle with with structure group the conformal group. Okay. And you extend this principal bundle to a larger subgroup P in a very specific way using these wild connections. Yeah, and the way you construct this gives you this tautological form. And then you can, you can check if you, if you extend your isomorphism that you have downstairs to a linear isomorphism upstairs, you can associate to such a thing, again, pointwise a curvature. Yeah? Like the torsion in the last example was pointwise, here this curvature bit becomes pointwise. And then you do a bit of algebra, and you find out that there is a unique such, such leaf for which the Ricci type contraction of this curvature vanishes. And then you're done, basically. Yeah? In each point upstairs, you have found your linear isomorphism. You just check that things fit together smoothly, and therefore they define you the Cartan connection. This is how you classically construct the Cartan geometry describing the conformal structure. Okay, um, right. So, yeah, um, in the remaining five minutes that I have, or seven minutes that I have, um, I, will, I will briefly talk about alternative descriptions to prepare the way for, for lectures to come. So, okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this simple and, and not rush too much. So. It will be a bit eclectic, I think. Okay, so the first thing is um, we are here in a Cartan uh, geometry means principal bundle plus Cartan connection, which is analogous to a principal connection. Question is, can't I do something like associated vector bundles and induced linear connections? And indeed, you can. And 
This is what is called tractor bundles or tractor kettle. Uh, this is just a description of, or an equivalent description, as it turns out, of the Cartan geometry in a setting that looks like associated vector bundles and linear connections. Okay. Right. Um, okay. So. Um, <clears throat> But, so, okay, if you, if you take a, a, a Cartan connection in general, there is no induced linear connection on associated vector bundles. But there is a situation in which you get an induced linear connection, but this is now pretty unusual from a geometric point of view, because what you have to do is you have to take a representation V of the Lorentz group, okay. SOM plus one, one, then you can, of course, restrict this representation to the subgroup P. No problem about that. And then you can form an associated bundle to the Cartan bundle. Okay? And this gives you what is called uh, tractor bundles. And the simplest choice in the, in the realm of conformal structures is just this Lorentz group SOM plus 1, 1 has an obvious representation on RM plus 2. If this representation take the associated vector bundle, you get what is called the standard tractor bundle. So this is, this is standard tractor bundle, while the standard representation of, of the Lorentz group. There also will be, uh, this will play some role in what I'm doing later, the so-called adjoint tractor bundle, where you take the adjoint representation on the Lie on these bundles, you canonically get linear connections. But all these bundles are higher order geometric objects. Yeah? Because if you look at this, yeah, um, if you take the standard representation of the Lorentz group, any element of this Lorentz group X non trivial. In particular, these elements of P plus that give you conformal isometries that fix a point to first order. This acts non trivially there. So these elements act non trivially on tractors, which tells you you cannot hope for an obvious description in terms of tensors or something like that. There has to be an additional ingredient because you see the second order stuff there. Okay. And this is the key about this, this tractorial picture there. Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, are these bundles in, uh, embedded in some chat bundle? Yes, in this case they are. In general, it's not so easy. Yeah. The, 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 the trouble with chat bundles is this depends on torsion freeness. Yeah. If you want to do jet bundles, you are restricted somehow to torsion free cases or you have to work a lot. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, it turns out that, that each of these guys is equivalent to, to the Cartan geometry, so you can recover the Cartan description from the tractor description and so on and so forth. Okay. So now maybe I'll briefly sketch how to get to an, to an explicit description of these tractor bundles. And in the picture we've developed, this is really easy to see because recall, our extension of the principal bundle was done by attaching to each point the values of all wild connections. So if you choose one wild connection, and in particular, if you choose a levi civita connection of a metric in the conformal class, this gives you a section of this extension. Okay, so whenever you choose a metric in the conformal class and take its levi civita connection, it gives you a section from G0 back to G. Yeah. And once you have this section, any associated bundle to G can be viewed as an associated bundle to G0. And associated bundles to G0, you understand, because it's just the, 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 the basic description of a conformal structure. Yeah? So you can immediately interpret it. You can also pull back the Cartan connection and things like that and compute stuff explicitly. Okay. And this is what is usually meant by tractor calculus. Okay. 
Yeah. So maybe this is this is too too complicated here. Yeah. So for for the case of the tractor bundle, what this says is choose a metric in the conformal class. So this is standard tractors. Okay. This gives you an identification of your tractor bundle with the sum of three bundles, two of which are density bundles, yeah, so conformally weighted functions, and one of them is conformally weighted one forms. Okay, and there is an explicit formula how this identification changes when you change your choice of matrix. Okay. And then you can take the bundle matrix that you have on the standard tractor bundle and the tractor connection and describe them explicitly. Okay. And at this point, you may turn things around. You may forget that there was a Cartan description in the background. And you just take this, this point of view here as defining the tractor bundle. So you say my tractor bundle is described as follows. Whenever I choose a metric, it's identified with blah, blah, blah. When I change my mind about this identification, the identification changes as follows. And you write out these, these formulae, yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll flash them because I have them on the next page. Yeah, it's, not, it's not terribly important what these look like. Yeah? It's just simple, explicit formula, chosen a metric, chosen its legacy guitar connection. Yeah, this, is, this is the first thing you get flashed when you hear a talk in which tractor calculus occurs. Yeah? And the interpretation via Cartan geometry is go through this procedure that I was discussing before, choose a, choose a metric in the conformal class, you get this split thing, you can describe the tractor bundle in downstairs terms, and somebody fortunately has computed already what this looks like, and this is what it, what it looks like. Right. The, just a second. The alternative approach is take this as a definition and compute that whatever you do here behaves in the right way when you change your mind about your matrix. And you know that you've done something that is conformally invariant. Yeah. And then you can use these, these descriptions as an alternative description of the standard tractor bundle, which equivalently encodes the Cartan bundle. Uh, and this is, this is the approach that is taken in uh, if you just do tractor calculus from scratch. Okay, and I think at this at this point, uh, yeah, it it will be better. Ah, yeah, you had a question. Yeah, yeah. show the previous slide. Please. Yeah, sure. Very fast. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. So I, I think at this point it's it's better to stop and not say anything about the ambient metric and conformal compactness. It was preparatory anyway. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Are there some extra questions? About K, you mentioned that it's invariant K. If you manage, if someone manages to define the here. Um, is it invariant to all orders or to some particular order? The first one is uh, an example for. I'm not completely sure what you mean. K, K that contains, yeah. from what I understand, both the curvature and the torsion, right? Is it invariant to all orders or is there, again, a, a constraint to some specific order as a, something that appeared in the conformal? Okay. So, uh, right. The question was. The curvature K is it invariant to all to all orders? So first of all, this description in terms of torsion and curvature only works for these groups of eight fine transformations. In general, the Cartan curvature is a much more complicated object, and again, it's a second order object. Yeah. So there, there, there is a description in terms of underlying stuff, which in conformal geometry it boils down to the Weyl curvature. Yeah. So this is the essential invariant. But actually, the Cartan curvature itself already is a more complicated object than the Weyl curvature. You know, the Weyl curvature is just the fundamental part of it. 
Yeah. But this is the, the, the curvature itself is, is preserved by automorphisms completely. So there is no restrictions on the order. Yeah, but this interpretation of as, as torsion and curvature is really just for this for this restricted class of geometries. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's it's much more complicated, although um, I mean, what is always there is, in general, you always have an, an, an abstract version of, of torsion. Yeah, you can always form a, a quotient of the Cartan curvature, which, which is a torsion type invariant. Yeah, and then, then it's getting more complicated because if this is, if this is non-zero, then the higher order parts do not have so, such, such elementary, elementary descriptions. Yeah, I mean, what you can definitely do is in this in this tractorial language. Yeah, so formally similar to that, you can you can also write out what the Cartan curvature looks like after the choice of a metric. Yeah, and then if you're familiar with conformal, it is cooked up from Weil curvature and the Cotton York tensor. Yeah, and the Cotton York tensor is is not invariant. In general, but you can mix Weil tensor and Colton York into something which is invariant as a, as a section of an appropriate extended bundle. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can you please explain more about the problem of the embedding in a jet space? The problem of about the embedding in the, in the jet space. Um, I'm not sure how I would how, how I would phrase this most easily. Um, so the point is basically what you can what you can think about in, in doing these constructions yeah, is, is really you, you start with the infinitesimal automorphism equation and you start prolonging it. Yeah. And uh, this, this automatically brings you into jet spaces. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what to, to say this most easily. Um, the, the trouble is, um, um, jets are not well suited to deal with torsions. Yeah, I mean, you can easily deal with 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 one jets that are split by a connection. Yeah, but if you if you start splitting two jets or something like that, this works out nicely if you use a torsion-free connection. But you get you get trouble and things become very complicated if you use connections with torsion. Yeah, and typically in in these in these structures, yeah, for conformal this is not an issue because conformal structures are torsion-free from the beginning. Yeah, but there are analogs of conformal structures, like uh, almost quaternionic structures or something like that, or almost Grassmannian structures, which are on a very similar level. Yeah. And, and they are going to a jet picture, and these, these may have intrinsic torsion. Yeah. And this intrinsic torsion is unremovable. So any, any connection that is compatible with this structure will have non-trivial torsion unavoidably. And then uh, this, this picture of, of, uh, of jets becomes complicated. I mean, basically, um, the, the point is, okay, it's, it's easy to get things into one jets of one jets. This is very easy. But two jets within one jets of one jets is a very complicated business because this, this contains a symmetry condition. And this symmetry condition is ungeometric. Yeah, this, this symmetry condition comes from partial derivatives. And this, this is where, where you get the troubles from. Yeah, so there is a, a notion, if you've heard that, of, of semi-holonomic two jets. Yeah, it works. Yeah, but into true two jets, you only get if things are if, if things are uh, The, the tractor bundle, the standard tractor bundle, is a statement that it is uh, it can be obtained as a certain prolonged, continuously prolonged PD. 
it's almost uh, yeah yeah you can you can then it's a circuit so yeah yeah but this is torsion for the bundle yeah for the for the standard tractor bundle this this works because this is just uh, if you analyze the rescaling to an the, the, the equation describing rescaling to an Einstein metric in the control models, yeah, you can view this as, as formal solutions to this equation to say well, this brings you into a into a JFT show. But the, the problem really is if you if you just prolong standardly, you, you run into uh, one jets of one jets and not into two jets unless you are on, on Euclidean space. Uh, if you try to do something like that on a contact manifold or something like that, you're, you're getting into troubles. Okay. So the, the, the trouble, in a way, is that in um, in the descriptions of jets, the translations on are in, in uh, and they are not the usual thing to do here in general because you're about for conformal and stuff and stuff like that. But in general, it's not it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. I just had a question. Does the curvature of the structure connection appear essentially the same as the Cartan connection of yeah. new information? No. no. Uh, so the question was whether the curvature of the tractor connection is the same as the Cartan curvature. It is precisely the same. Yeah. So if if you look at the at the, at the Cartan curvature as a two form on the Cartan bundle, yeah, and you do this associated bundle cons construction. The curvature on any tractor, tractor bundle is just given by the by the action of the Cartan curvature in a very similar fashion as induced connections from a principal connection. The curvature is always given by the action of the curvature of the principal connection. This is this is precisely the same. So there is nothing nothing new coming out from tractor bundles. Initially, they are really just an equivalent description. It's just in 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 some cases, it, it's much much more feasible for computations and for getting explicit. Uh, the, the advantage is whenever you do something in tractor language, um, you automatically get an explicit formula after the choice of a metric in the conformal class and things like that. The disadvantage, in a way, is if you're thinking about general geometric structures, you can work uniformly for different Cartan geometries while their tractor descriptions may look very different. 